Hey, it looks like we are one minute away from start time. So I will go ahead and introduce um, this part two of our Persist 14 webinar. Uh, last week, Michael Guess um, talked about trends and the role of EEG trending in EEG monitoring. And that part one is now up and available on YouTube. For those of you that attended uh, last week's webinar, we are still catching up on sending links uh, to the video and also answering questions that were not answered during the webinar. So please know that we are still working on getting those to you. So please watch your email inboxes for that. In the meantime, um, I can also share the recording from part one in the Q&A uh, for this week, if that's helpful. Um, otherwise, today we are here to uh, let Mike talk about part two, which involves monitoring for changes fast and slow. He's going to wrap up um, what he began last week for us. And we'll also review some of the changes in P14, since I know that's why a lot of you are here. Um, I'll just quickly say that um, my name is Marie. I am Director of Product Management with Persist. And Michael Guess is our VP of Research and Clinical Applications. He's been with Persist for 22 years. And with that, I will let him take it away. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for joining us for the continuation of our discussion on Persist 14 and quantitative EEG for continuous monitoring. And uh, one of our co-hosts says uh, that he can't see me. Marie, I'm just going to see if the video is working on your end. I can see me. Yeah, I can see you, Mike. Um, okay. Yeah. And, you know, it's important we see the slides and the software as we go forward. So let's do that. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. So here's my, here are my uh, disclosures, obviously. And if we go one more jump forward, I'll bring up uh, a more concise list of uh, what we discussed in part one. So Persist 14 has some major new capabilities across the board. The user interface has been updated in a way that provides greater ease of use while still remaining familiar to anyone who's used Persist 12 and 13. There's the new seizure detector and the new heart rate trend that we looked at in part one of this talk and the new versus baseline trend that we'll look at today. Uh, there's a new standalone persist database and numerous, enhance numerous enhancements to persist EEG review throughout. But the, uh, the new seizure detector is definitely the centerpiece of a tremendous amount of work that's been done to bring Persist 14 to fruition. So here's what we're gonna be looking at today. Uh, we're going to look at the one more trend type. Uh, that's very important. It's new. Uh, do a very quick review of the other trend types as we look at uh, multi-trend panels. And we're going to look at multi-patient displays because bringing them together in a single view makes it easier to get an overview than having to look across rows of separate monitors. Same thing goes for notifications for seizure detections. We'll look at bringing those together in a centralized way because it's easier to manage those in a single view and scattered across rows of monitors as well. And then look at web-based monitoring and review within the facility and on mobile devices because descriptions over the phone, uh, they can take longer, they're not quite as descriptive. Um, and to wrap things up, in this two-part series, we're gonna be looking over spike review in greater detail, uh, including details on how Persist Spike Detector works to populate the spike trends. Uh, the spike review program for reviewing detections by group and the voltage plot program for viewing detailed voltage and propagation maps. And we'll describe more about that as we go forward. Um, so this last category of trends are something different. Up until now, we've been looking at trends that show what's happening in the EEG for whatever parameters being trended at that particular moment. And looking at changes is done visually. And if you don't see a change within the trend panel, you can increase the duration or go to the previous day's recording or go back multiple days. So statistical or versus baseline trends do something different. They allow you to see changes for any trended parameter as a difference from whatever the baseline was set, either automatically or at the start of recording hours or days before for you know, specific patient states. So you can set a baseline and then look at comparisons from that. So in general though, one question that may have arisen already is this, how do you know when zooming out on a trend that 
it's going to yield something useful. How do you know which recordings should be compared with recording stages hours or days ago? And so for some patients where you have slowly evolving changes, uh, or if you expect them, uh, delayed cerebral ischemia might be one of those. Recording a parameter at certain patient states and then checking that parameter over time might be done. Uh, for example, you might look at the alpha delta ratios for patient state and then manually compare them using a statistical measure at periodic intervals every several hours or so. So there's some use of statistical parameters uh, already, um, but it's not really done in a way that you can see those just by looking at the trends. And so here we can uh, look at an example of way to do that. So we're going to apply statistical measures to changes in EEG. And in this example, we're looking at a visual comparison of pre-clamp EEG to two successive epochs of post-clamp EEG. And we'll look at the loss of amplitude on the left uh, in the first comparison, and then a little later in the second comparison, we're going to look at similar amplitudes between two epochs, but slower on the left versus right. So if we look at this, and I'm going to go ahead and use that wonderful pointer that they, uh, that they give us and see how that works. Nice. Okay. So here we're looking at uh, the pre-clamp EEG and channels on the left channels on the right, and this is that initial comparison. So we're looking at two separate epochs. This is a later time slice post-clamp, and we can see that we have this loss of amplitude here. And if we go a little further along, again, this left part is still looking at that pre-clamp EEG, and we've gone forward just a little bit. We can see that from the time down at the bottom. We've gone forward just a little bit, and we can see that the EEG on the left uh, is slower compared to this point, this comparison. So we're going to be comparing in both of these to this preclamp EEG. Now we did that visually. So here's the same carotid and arterectomy. And we placed a baseline here in the recording, and that's at this pre-clamp EEG, and we can see that I've just placed a comment here to indicate that. And over on the spectrogram, we have left hemisphere and right hemisphere, zero to 20 hertz. And so this is the point that we're marking as our baseline. Here's our versus baseline spectrograms, and they're showing us changes, increasing amplitude at those frequencies, or increasingly red, decreasing, increasingly green, and we're going to look at what happens when we go further into this, and we can already see the change over on the right-hand side of that. So we're still comparing to this baseline. So this is the pre-clamp baseline here for this carotid and arterectomy. And I've moved the EEG to this point, this cursor here. And we can see in the spectrogram, there's this change here where there's a loss of faster frequencies. We can see the colors going darker here. Now the change spectrogram, and this is a nice example of this because we can see the change, you know, right from the baseline that we have visible. But in practice, you may be setting baselines, you know, hours or even days before or any time that you want. But typically, you want a stable patient state. So here we're looking at the versus baseline spectrogram. We're looking at this green area that's it indicating what's happening on the left. And we can see that we have this loss of amplitude uh, pretty much across, you know, right from the delta range all the way up. It's solid green here. And so this is indicating that when we compare it to that baseline that we've lost uh, from theta all the way up uh, in amplitude because we have those z-scores decreasing, they're turning increasingly green. Now let's go ahead and go forward in the EEG just a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and indicate where we are in this trend. So we've gone just a little bit further. And we can see at this point that this dark red patch is showing up. And what this is telling us is that at these slower frequencies, delta the theta, that there's a lot more of that higher in amplitude at those frequencies when compared to this initial baseline. And we can see here in the left-hand EEG, 
our left hemisphere EEG, that we have an increase in that amplitude. So we have a loss of faster frequencies and then an increase in the slower frequencies compared to this initial baseline. So another way that we can look at what the versus baseline is doing is we can look at a water test because those are very significant changes uh, based on uh, when an injection was made. So here we have an asymmetry spectrogram up at the top and AEEG left and right hemisphere below that. And the EEG changes at the first and second injection can be seen over the trend duration. And we're gonna go ahead and look at those uh, as we go for the uppermost trend though. Again, is showing us that at this first injection, the EEG becomes right weighted because it's turning red. And then at the second injection, the EEG becomes left weighted and it's turning blue and it's turning blue down at the lower part of that asymmetry spectrogram. And with the accompanying AEG, we can see an increase in amplitude on the left, and then it's gradually fading away as the medication wears off. And the right stays fairly consistent, so this gives us context. Now, let's change this a little bit and look at this in terms of statistical changes from that baseline. So, these are the two new trends at the top. We have versus baseline spectrogram, so it's still showing us frequency. We're scaled zero to 20 hertz at the right. That scaling those we talked about as it goes increasingly red, higher Z scores, meaning that we have more of that with respect to the baseline. And increasingly green, we have less of it with respect to the baseline. So this is looking at that baseline. Here we place the cursor and this is the baseline EEG. Now here's the EEG at the first injection. So we've moved the cursor to here. The versus baseline spectrogram shifts to red, mostly on the right, indicating an increase in Z scores, which is increasing amplitude versus the baseline. So there's an increase in delta and beta frequencies versus the baseline. So there's that lower portion of the trend, lower frequencies turning red and the upper portion of that trend. And we can see that there's a mix of increase in faster and slower frequencies and Importantly, the artifact reduction, there's a fair amount of muscle here, and the artifact reduction is separating that from the cerebral signal. And so that grade portion on the EEG is the original signal and the muscle that's been separated from the cerebral signal. Now we've moved forward to the second injection. And our cursor is sitting here. And we can see that the changes in the underlying EEG, these are the left channels, right, left, right. So we have slowing on the left, and that shows up as this dark red patch towards the bottom. And again, we're comparing to that original baseline. And then of course we have admixture of uh, faster frequencies riding along that as well. And you can see that in the EEG waveforms. And so importantly, when we're looking at the previous trends, it was showing us what was happening at that point in the EEG, the versus baseline show us what's different in this case, as far as uh, frequency content uh, versus that original baseline segment. So let's jump forward a little bit and bring these things together because for the most part, we've been looking at trend types individually. And in practice, those trends that represent different aspects of the underlying EEG are combined into a panel. And so here's a multi-trend panel. And from top to bottom, I'm gonna bring the cursor up here. Here we have the uh, artifact, physiological artifacts. So we're looking at muscle, vertical eye, lateral eye. And we talked about these in the first part of this uh, series. And as the color goes darker, we have more of that physiological artifact. Below that, we have seizure probability from zero to one. We talked about that as the probability goes higher. The algorithm is indicating the probability uh, according to its calculations that a human expert would mark that. And then we have the spikes greater than three per 10 second page. And this is picking up some of the sharp uh, spikes that are and sharp, sharply contour theater that are part of that seizure. And they're showing up with each one of these seizure indications. Below that, we have this rhythmicity spectrogram, left hemisphere, right hemisphere. We're going one to 25 Hertz. And as we talked about in part one, these are scaled from one, five, 10, 15 and 25 Hertz. So the lower portions of this are opened up a bit more 
And the reason for that is we still want to see what's happening at the higher frequencies, beta seizures, uh, harmonics of seizures, and so forth. So it's part of the seizure print because seizures often have multiple frequency components and it's very distinctive uh, for the seizure. At the same time, we want to be able to see changes in delta. Uh, and so opening up that frequency range at the bottom just makes it easier to read. And of course we can scale these if they're too faint or too dark by clicking on the scale uh, right here and it'll bring up a scale change and we'll do that as we look at P14 long. Uh, spectrograms, left and right hemisphere, we talked about how those show not just what's rhythmic or periodic in the EEG, but the amplitude regardless of that, uh, using this color scale. And this is scaled linear, 0, 10, 20 hertz. And we can see uh, these seizure patterns showing up in both the rhythmicity spectrogram and the, uh, and the FFT spectrograms. Asymmetry spectrogram, we're seeing an increase in the amplitude on the right for each one of these seizures versus the left. And then the interictal pattern is indicating the amplitude's higher on the left versus the right. So what's happening, that's what we find out from the AEG trend here. Left and right hemisphere, we have a symmetry, it's pink. But what's happening here is that we have an increase in the amplitude during the right-sided seizures, and then the amplitude on the right falls. And we have this blue fringe remaining fairly constant for the interictal and the ictal pattern. So we're not seeing a lot of change in the amplitude on the left, it's really happening on the right. We have heart rate, and we can see a change in heart rate for each one of these seizures. And by the way, we're looking at a, um, at a one hour panel here. So then we have what we've just discussed, the versus baseline. And we have a baseline here at the beginning of this. It's an automatic baseline set by the software. And in practice, you're gonna set your own baselines as well, but this allows it to begin populating right away and gives you some useful information right away because it'll automatically steer around seizures and bad electrodes and so forth and look for a good place to set that automatic baseline. But here we can see this increasing red pattern indicating higher z-scores for each one of those seizures. So let's go ahead and go into Persist 14 and look at another recording and see how we would uh, go through these trends in a more dynamic way and pick out parts of interest as we go. So I'm gonna move some screen items around a little bit here and pick a new share. And so this should have, I'll just check with my uh, co-host to make sure that the screen is updated to show Persist 14. And if it has, I'll go ahead and get started with that. So yep. this is a recording we're going to look at a number of things with, but let's start with the trends. We're also going to look at spike review and voltage plot with this, uh, with this particular example as we go forward as well. So first off, uh, here's an example of typical EEG. We've got eye blink, we've got muscle, and one of the things we talked about in the first part was the importance of artifact reduction. So when I toggle that, you can see that it's showing what we have on the left side of the screen, which is a lot of artifact muscle and eye blink. So when I click in the AR button at the top, artifact reduction on, we can see the ghosted image is the original EEG, and we can see the artifact that's separated, and we can do that over on the right. So normally we're going to leave artifact engaged on the right, and whether you do it or not on the left is up to you because you don't have to reprocess it or do anything terribly complicated to use artifact reduction. You just engage it. And one of the interesting things is you can just use muscle and you can also have it uh, not remove lateral and vertical eye as well. So you can control some aspects of that as you're going. So right off the bat, we have uh, trends that we described just prior to this using that uh, periodic seizure example. And first thing I'm gonna do in this case is I'm just gonna page forward in the, uh, in the trends. So one of the things we can look for when we're going through these is state changes. So we can look up at the top, we can see artifact intensity, muscle, vertical eye, lateral eye. And here we can see that uh, vertical eye and lateral eye have shallowed out. And we can see in the rhythmicity spectrogram, left and right hemisphere, we can see that we have rhythmic activity here. It's bilateral, it's linear, it's not evolving, it's alpha. And so we can see that uh, we can get to a place pretty quickly where eyes are closed. We can tell that from this trend and we can also see 
that uh, alpha is here and have a look at it, make any measurements we want. Um, even under the tools menu, there's a quick stats. I can just drag a box around this and get a quick amplitude and frequency measurement pretty easily. So let's go a little further along. And here I can see some mushy stuff. That's a scientific term, mushy stuff down at the bottom of this rhythmicity spectrogram. And you get used to looking at these patterns after a while. This is uh, chewing. And if we turn off the artifact reduction, you can see that it really has a big effect on the trends. Now these don't have any particular shape to them. So seizures normally have something about them that indicates some evolution and so forth. So I'm not seeing any of that here. I'm just gonna keep going forward through this. Again, we have a part where here's some alpha again over the right. And then this trend is that thin line showing up in the rhythmicity spectrogram. And by the way, we're also seeing it in the versus baseline because when we set that baseline, it was at the beginning of the recording, eyes open. And that alpha is showing up as a red line here, indicating that there is more of that compared to that original patient state. So let's go a little further along. And we find something here where we have a seizure detection. I can click immediately into that. And so again, just this underlying thing is I'm using all the trends to look for changes in the underlying EEG because each trend indicates a different aspect of the underlying signal. So artifact intensity, I can see an increase in that. When I toggle the artifact rejection here, I can look through the muscle, see the underlying cerebral signal, but I can see that that's a seizure. And as I go forward through that, this downward sloping line here, and I can zoom in a little bit to make it easier to see. There's that downward sloping line. So what that's indicating is how rhythmic activity that's going faster to slower. Now this asymmetry spectrogram turning blue, I can see that from the underlying EEG, it's weighted towards the left. Now following that seizure, this asymmetry spectrogram turns red at the top and blue towards the bottom. And what we have is some postictal slowing. Now there's something else in this trend that we can see heart rate changes before the seizure, we can see the heart rate down at the bottom here. And by the way, if I want to make an adjustment to this pretty easy, I can just double click on the channel and I can change that sensitivity uh, because it's set as an individual channel. So just to double click on it and you can make those adjustments whenever you want. So I can see that the heart rate increases during the seizure. And we've also Got a slow decay back to the baseline heart rate after that uh, versus baseline trend, of course, here turning dark red at this point, indicating that we have an increase in amplitude at those frequencies compared to that original baseline. What else can we see? We have some spike detections, all foci count per second. Now, before this, remember this artifact intensity, if we scooch back just a little bit here, I'm going to use that single arrow on the bottom. Uh, I don't see any artifact intensity here. It's pretty, pretty quiet. And I do see an increase in spikes. So I'm getting some information about the uh, physiological state of the patient. And as I page forward through this, and I can change gain if I want to pretty easy, just from the top page into this. And I can see some left temporal spikes here that are indicated uh, in this spike detections, all five side. We can see those beginning to increase in rate. And these are blue down at the bottom when we have greater than three per 10 second page, indicating that they're on the left. And the patient's asleep. And so during sleep, and we can tell they're asleep from the, uh, from the EEG, they're having an increase in these left temporal discharges, and then the seizure. Now, following the seizure, we don't see any seizure detections or spike detections after that. And so if we page to this, we see that we're not getting. Uh, spike detections were in that postical pattern. Paging through that, I'll stop here for a moment because I may be outrunning the internet at this point. And uh, then let's zoom out a little bit because we're going to look at one other thing. And I'm going to go ahead and go to the full screen trends. And I'm going to switch this time scale out to an hour. Let's go to two hours. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and let things settle down on the screen here. 
I've got two seizure detections actually over this two hours. I can put a second one over here and I can just click there and go to the underlying EEG and say, yep, there's a seizure detection. And by the way, uh, we also had electrode become dislodged. So if I go back to the trends and I turn off the artifact reduction, we can see that bad electrodes will uh, overwhelm the trends. So being able to automatically and identify, automatically identify and remove those bad electrodes is, is really helpful. So kick on the artifact reduction. It dynamically pulls that out. And we can see here that there's uh, spike detections abate for a while, and then they begin to come back. And we don't really have much artifact up at the top. So muscle, vertical eye, lateral eye. And if we click into this point and go to the underlying EEG, uh, we can see there's sleep patterns and there's, there's left temporal spikes. So we can see that during sleep, they seem to be having these spike discharges. Now, when we go a little bit further in this, we can see this thing over on the right, pretty familiar. We were looking at it earlier, alpha. I'll go ahead and split the screen. And so the spikes stop. We can see that that spike rate just completely vanishes there. And so what happened? Well, they went from being asleep. And if I click here at this point, I can even open up the trends a little bit to be a little more precise in where I'm landing. Uh, it's in arousal. So they woke up. Then their eyes are closed at this point, apparently. And as we go a little bit further in, there's another seizure preceded by those spikes. So using the trends together, they all complement each other. They're all showing different things. And as I'm scanning through this recording, I'm really looking at all that. I'm not focusing on any one trend. I'm looking for changes in those trends and taking it in as a whole. Um, now these versus baseline trends, there's some interesting things you can do with those. You can mark a section of EEG. And again, if you wanna see where places are identical to that, that it's, gonna be, it's gonna be quite faint. So, um, and then when we have changes from that baseline, it's either gonna turn increasingly red or increasingly blue to green if we have less of that. So let's go ahead and click out of that part. So I'm gonna switch the display to a new share and go up to that. Okay, here we go. We're back into this. Now, we went through and looked at um, the, using the trends in, in, a, uh, in a way where we're using all of them to complement giving us information about the underlying EEG. So here, let's look at ways of managing the data from multiple patients all at once. So we've looked at focusing on one patient um, of course, if we're monitoring multiple patients at once, is it helpful to bring those together on a single page? And let's look at centralized notifications for bringing those together. And also how we can do this within the hospital to help us get a look at what's, what's happening with patients. So here's an example of a multi-patient display. And I'm gonna grab my handy uh, arrow tool over here. There it is. And so this is gonna update as the re recordings progress. And you can set different numbers of cells on this. You can set it to automatically recognize new recordings as they start and begin showing what's happening. So here, these names are uh, just names of the uh, recordings. You can see GPEPs, it's a little bit of a blast from the past, an older naming convention for that file because it's, uh, it's that particular recording is many years old. Now we call them GEPs. So, uh, each one of these is an individual patient, and you can have trends show uh, any configuration you want for that. You, so you can set it to show what's at the bedside, or you can have a specific customized uh, multi-patient monitor trend uh, with just the, just the highlights of what you, what you want to have in that centralized display. 
So this would be an addition too, where you can just look in one place and see what's happening with each patient. And right away, we can see uh, in this upper right, we have some seizure detections going on, some changes in the rhythmicity spectrogram. So there's an evolving rhythmic pattern. Uh, same thing in this uh, bottom middle one. And when you click on any one of these, it'll just bring it into a full screen display and you can see what's going on. So this is put on a computer, but what else can we do? Now in a web view within the hospital, so you could do it on a browser, you could do it on a tablet, uh, you could do it on a um, iOS device. We have an iPad app. And we're showing multiple patients and these are gonna be updating live uh, for each one of those recordings. So we can have a matrix showing of each recording as it's going. And if we click over to the notifications tab, what we have here is a centralized uh, display that you can have showing up at a monitor in the monitoring room with just notifications. And, or you can pull this up on an iPad and, and view it. You can acknowledge those. So, uh, and of course the names of these patients have been created for the purposes of illustration. Now, when we click on a seizure detection, uh, what it'll do is it'll bring it up uh, in, a, in a browser window in this case, since we're using, uh, showing the, the browser-based review. And you can bring up the EEG and the trends, you can change gain, montage filters, you can view video. So it gives you a pretty, pretty fully featured review just in a browser client. So, that's what you can do in the hospital. So you can have multi-patient displays to pull it together in a single window. You can uh, bring multiple live trends together uh, and those notifications for seizure notifications or other notifications you wanna have in a single display. But you can also do that in a mobile way as well. So those mobile notifications and on iOS it's integrated. So it will, so on Apple devices, it'll actually bring up a, uh, an indication and a unique sound that that is being triggered. Now, if you're using Android, uh, you would use the Chrome browser and it's not gonna pass those notifications through the browser, but it will allow you to see them, to acknowledge them, so you can check in on them any time using Android. Uh, with the iOS, it goes another step further by actually putting up a notification badge and letting you know that uh, one of those has popped up. And you can select uh, that notification and go to the underlying EEG, uh, again, just using an iPad or a uh, Android device if you're using a Chrome browser or a desktop PC browser. So if we go back just a little bit, um, so typically what's done for viewing things from outside of the hospital, you use the hospital's existing security implementation, whether it is VPN or what have you. And we're of course happy to work with uh, hospital IT if you wanna make those same sorts of capabilities available to on a mobile basis. So moving on, this is our, uh, our last section on looking into the EEG. Actually, there's one other piece that is we're gonna look at high frequency displays uh, with an intracranial EEG looking at high gamma. And that's in the example, we're gonna look at some phase lock high gamma. Uh, but let's look and see how the spike detector works. So we're gonna look at detection montages, sensitivity, and the spike index tool. So just to review, uh, seizure detections can be displayed as text comments and as event density. So the, up in the uh, top here, we have this event density just really just showing us that we have uh, a seizure detection, that it rose up above its threshold for the amount of time that you can set uh, just by clicking into the seizure probability. This is a zoomed in window on this trend up above, just to make it larger. And I've taken the comment list over here and I've zoomed in. So. Um, seizure probability again goes zero to one. The higher the probability, the higher it goes. And so rather than just a yes or no detection or no detection, we get to see the algorithm's probability calculation pretty easily. And uh, it can be helpful when there's not much of a probability deflection to be able to just click on that and say, well, why did the probability begin to go up at that point? Even if it didn't rise to the level of triggering the detector, you can still have a look and see gee, why is, it, why is it beginning to deflect at that point? Um, so in this case, having them as a seizure detection in the comment list is useful. Having them show up in the trend is useful as well because it gives you context of how they're happening over time. Now, spike detections are a different challenge. Uh, EMU recordings can have hundred or you know, thousands of detections today. Certainly, IC recordings 
you can have with periodic discharges, you can have thousands and thousands of detections per day. So when there are a large number of detections, spike density trends and clustering add uh, a way to look at those in the context of what's happening in the EEG because then uh, while this long comment list, which I've zoomed in from the light can be helpful uh, in zooming in on an individual detection, uh, it can paint a picture of how are these happening in context, what rate are they happening at and so forth. So let's look at some examples of that. And we talked about this a bit in part one. Uh, this EEG page is displayed at a point where the spike rate uh, is about one per second. And so what we're seeing here, and I've just zoomed in on the trend to, uh, to enlarge this part, this is that spike detections all count. So this is the spike rate here. If we're a third of the way up, it's up to one per second, two thirds of the way up is up to two per second, and all the way up is three per second or greater. So we have an indication of rate, and we're at a point where that rate is a little bit lower. So, uh, and we're also seeing that there's greater than three per 10 second page, and it's indicating that these are uh, on the left because it's rendered in blue. Let's look at another example of how that can work. So again, over on the right, we have the list of uh, detections. And here I'm zooming in on this particular spike trend where we're seeing uh, spike detections. We see a rate here, and that black one's going all the way up, indicating it's three per second or greater. And here we have greater than three per 10 second page. So this short spike burst shows up as a green block here because it's detecting these as generalized spikes. And this is an ESIS patient. And so here we have, uh, again, an enlargement of this trend at this point. And we're looking at spike detections, the rates. And so we can see here the rate going up. And here we can see where we have an admixture of different colors. So some are being marked as generalized left or right or left and right. So let's go a little further into this. Right now we're at this point in the trend and we're looking at the underlying EEG there. So if we click forward to this point in the trend, and again, I'm zooming in on this and there's that cursor indicating where we are in the trend. We can see that the spike rate has increased and we can see that increased rate of spikes here. So we don't really see that as easily from that comment list. So adding to that, these uh, spike trends can give us information about rate, about context, about when they're happening, and some information about where they're happening as well. Now, how does this do this? So uh, the spike detector actually uses four montages to do its detection. And so the primary montage is a referential, average 12 longitudinal. And these, by the way, there's a montage favorites here. You can add these to the favorites and uh, have them for review. Otherwise they show up under other montages. So you can look and see what the spike detector uh, is using uh, to do its detection. Now, uh, these are described in detail. There's a uh, manuscript on the Persist website, spike detection, interreader agreement, and a statistical Turing test on a large data site. A uh, large data set that's published in the Journal of Clinical Neurophysiology. And uh, in a nutshell, using those neural networks uh, to monitor the background, the presence of or the absence of artifacts, the waveform morphology, and the field spread. And it also verifies the spike using these different montages. And so you can just click through these and see what the spike detector is saying and how it made its determination. Now, the other thing that's important to keep uh, in mind is that you can change detection sensitivity. So if we went into the Wayback Machine, once you did spike detection uh, decades ago, the sensitivity you set it for was what you got. Uh, but that is not the case with Persist 13 and 14. So in Persist 14, you have the spike sensitivity, low, medium, and high. And so the default is medium. And that's where only spikes with a probability of 0 0.4, so we're going from zero to one. So 0.4, about halfway. Uh, when you set it to medium, only spikes with a probability greater than 0.4 are gonna be shown in the comment list and um, in, the, uh, in the trends. When you set it to high, it shows all the detections from the minimum probability setting of 0.1 all the way to 1.0. So it pretty much opens the gates to everything coming through. And, uh, and setting the sensitivity low will restrict it to show anything that is at a level of 0.9 or higher. So by changing the sensitivity, you can do it during review. You don't have to reprocess it. 
it'll modify that sensitivity on the fly. Now, the other thing that you can do, and we touched on this briefly in part one, is you can calculate a spike wave index. So up here is an excerpt of that same trend that we've been zooming in on. You can mark a range uh, of EEG or of trend uh, using the mark range tool in Persist 14. And we can take a quick look at that. So I just marked this range here of spike detections during slow wave sleep and marked it with an add spike count. You can use whatever comment you want, of course. And what this is gonna do is by default, it'll set the epic length to one second and set the thresholds for spikes as greater than one per second. And then it's gonna calculate it that as being uh, continuous spike wave, and in this case, it's saying 70%, 70.2% of the epics exceeded that threshold. And these are all adjustable because these, you can just type in different, uh, different values in there. But this will give you a spike rate that in a paper that's linked off the website, uh, it showed that it was also comparable with human experts. And since that is an arduous process to do by hand, uh, that can help save some time as well. So now let's look at diving further into spike review. That's probably more, you could use it for any application, uh, but it's really perhaps more of an EMU thing. And we're gonna look at those detections from that same 24 hour ambulatory recording that uh, exhibits those spikes during sleep with a predominant left temporal spike focus. And there's a second spike focus with much less frequent left parietal spike. So we'll sec select exemplars from spike review, and then we're gonna go into the propagation or topographic and propagation maps to look at those in more detail. So. With that, let's go ahead and jump in. I'm going to share a different display and go back to that recording we were just looking at. And there it is. I'll double check that it's updated on the screen. Yep, certainly looks like it has. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so we went through and we looked at the spike detections using the spike detections uh, trend. We saw what patient state they happen to be uh, occurring. And so one of the things that we can do is we can look at these spikes by group. And so if we launch the spike review program from that button there, I already have it launched. So I'm gonna bring up the window and switch to it using the display switcher. Okay, so now we're in the spike review program. Now, the ways that we were looking at spikes previously is we were looking at them in the comment list, we are looking at them in trends. This allows us to look at them uh, in groups of where they were detected. And so here we can see uh, averages of each one of the detections. And when we see this uh, ref equals, that means that's the montage that it made a determination of focal versus generalized. So the primary, uh, the highest number of detections here is a T3, 1,345. And again, this is at the medium sensitivity. So let's go ahead and double click into this and we can look at the individual spikes. Now, um, might be a little tricky to do in this particular display, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway. I think we could, I think we'll be fine. So there's a hyperlink up at the top of these. And if you double click on, on one of these, not to worry, it's just gonna open up a, a larger display window and you can see those. When I click that, and let's see if I can go ahead and switch this to the display, showing the underlying EEG, uh, that's jumped it right to that point. And I can show the full page EEG. So within Spike Review, you can click on a hyperlink and it's gonna take you to that page of the EEG. So let's go ahead and go back to spike review and finish going through our spike detections. There we go. Now I clicked on the boxes around these to, uh, to select exemplars and I can page for these. So these are the ones that I've selected and you can mark them all or unmark them, but I'm just picking ones that I wanna use for further review. And so if I go back to the overview now back at the all spikes, and I can look for a different spike foci. So we can see some variations here. Uh, some were marked at T5, uh, some at F7. So uh, you could decide whether those are different or not to your liking. 
uh, there is some differences here if we go into the uh, into those averages and look at these. But what I'm going to do is to go to go back to the overview, and I'm going to point out something that can happen because it's uh, spike detection, spike review. Um, we're really going through. Sometimes you're going through an EEG at a rate where uh, we'll see oh, everything that's happening. But sometimes there can be things that are so rare or just not happening that frequently. And our chief medical officer, Mark Shore, used a Where's Waldo uh, comparison, and he showed a Where's Waldo social distancing edition where there was like two people in Waldo standing out in the middle. So that might be a visualization for this. So we have this predominant spike focus. And if we spike focus, and if we go a page forward, I just use that double arrow here, and I start looking through some of these, I can see here, and again, these are grand averages. I can use any montage I want. I can see that I've got a discharge here at P3 with a, with a uh, feel to it. And any montage you like is perfectly fine for doing these sorts of reviews. If I switch to a bipolar montage, uh, you'll see that there's a phase reversal at this point, a uh, field that makes sense. And then when I go into this particular group of P3s, just by double clicking on it, I've already selected some here. And here are these discharges. And something to keep in mind, there's only 25 of these marked uh, at that. And if we go back to the overview, there's over 1,300 marked here. So this is one that uh, could possibly be more difficult to pick out in a long recording. And here, since it's separating them by spike foci, then we can see each one of these individuals here. And you could decide if you want to keep any of these by putting a box around them. Again, you can go to the underlying EEG just by clicking that uh, hyperlink up at the top. Now, once we've done that, we can go to our final report once we reviewed our spike groups and decided what we want to do. Here we have a display showing the averages of the exemplars that we selected. So here we have the T3, N equals 50. And so that's an average of those 50 detections here. P3, I marked a dozen of those. And that's the average now to the right of that. And we can page forward through this are all the individual ones. And if I wanted to remove any of these, uh, on second thought, I can go ahead and click uh, and remove the box around those. So this is one stage of this. Now there's maps here. We can click the map button and it'll show us a map using uh, preset montage that you can set under the preferences. But let's go another step further here. So let's turn that off. We go to tools. We can export these groups, spikes, or mark, rather mark them as VPOC comments, and it's going to place those into the comment list. The export groups is a separate function. Actually, there's a number of functions in here for advanced spike review that I'm happy to go through uh, in a web conference for addressing individual questions, but we're going to go ahead and mark those groups as VPOC comments, and then let's go ahead and switch over to the other display and go back to the uh, Persist 14 window. Now from here, from the tools menu, we can launch voltage plot. And what does voltage plot do? Well, over on the right here, we have these voltage plot group equals one. And if we go a little further, group equals two. So those are the T3 and P3 spikes that we've marked. So once we have those, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up these, uh, the window that shows the uh, voltage plot program. We're going to switch into that, change the share. And there we are. Okay, so that should have updated to show the uh, voltage plot group, a voltage plot program. And right now I'm showing a referential montage and I'm showing an average of the uh, detections here. So if I click on one of these, you can see that only one of them is selected. I can manually select and build an average just by holding down the shift key and running down those, or I can click this button and click all of group one, which are all the G equals one spikes that were the T3s and I can display a map here. Uh, importantly, uh, you can pick any montage you want. Sometimes you wanna use a different reference, uh, a Laplacian or an average. Uh, you can pick a bipolar, but keeping in mind that it's helpful to look at averages and whatever montage you want to do. But once you select a bipolar montage, the maps aren't going to make as much sense. So we're going to leave it on that particular montage. Now, a propagation map is a way of looking at time slices over, the, over this particular spike discharge. So when I right click on this and go to properties, 
right off the bat here, we have the show voltage plots, rows and columns. I'm going to change this to three and click OK. And now we have what we call a propagation map, which is a time series. And you can add rows or columns to this as you like. You can change the time slices. This is going in 20 um, in five millisecond slices. So we have 20 milliseconds before the discharge, 15, 10, 5, 0. That's the peak. And then we're looking at five milliseconds slices after that. So here we can see if there's propagation uh, where we may have um, this indication of the voltage field shifting over time. Here it's pretty stable. Uh, and we can look at the other group of discharges here. So we can click the group button and we can look at group two. And these are the same propagation maps or time series maps uh, showing that P3 spike. And that red spot there is increasingly negative. Blue is increasingly positive. These are all adjustable. And we can see we're going at 20 milliseconds, 15, 10, all the way up to zero. And then we're looking at uh, after that. And this is pretty stable as well throughout this. Now, another thing we can look at if we right click and go to properties is sometimes we want to look at uh, the quality of the average. So let me go ahead and switch back to that first group. I'm going to click this button in the upper left, go to group one. Click OK. I'm just going to shade these. Again, you can select manually any individuals you want. But I want to look at the quality of this average. So by right clicking on this and going to properties, up at the top I have what's called error traces. And uh, even odd would show uh, all the odd numbered and all the even numbered traces and all the traces overlaid. And we can see they line up pretty well here. Uh, another way to do that, and probably uh, a better way to do this is overlay all. And what it's going to do is slightly shift the position of every one of those averages and show them individually. And by overlaying them all, I can see uh, if I've got a lot of variation in that average. And uh, in some cases, it looks like there are. But we can change gain. We can select individuals. And we can begin mapping these and building that average and decide if there's ones that we want to include or not, and then use those for subsequent analysis, for instance, source localization. Um, and so that's the use of the voltage plot tool for that. So let's go ahead and close this window. And there's a last option here. We're going to look at a high frequency display and then we'll take some questions. So let me go ahead and switch out to bring up an intracranial EEG. All right. So. Uh, let's go ahead and get our landmarks for what we're looking at here. Uh, I've trended this intracranial using uh, sets of uh, anatomically related channels, and these this is a stereo EG, so I've just picked uh, each one of these and created a trend. We're looking at 50 to 200 hertz activity, so we can see uh, that there is the presence of that and kind of the cyclic pattern. I'm just looking at 10 minutes of trend on the right. But let's go ahead and show just the EEG. And... Uh, this is the onset of a seizure, so one of the things that might be interesting is to look for the presence or the, what the morphology and topology, the high frequency activity is uh, by superimposing them with the waveforms. So a couple of things we'll do is let's go ahead and click the all button and let's reduce the number of channels just to make it a bit clearer uh, on, this, on this display since we're going through the web. So I've gone down to 24 channels, now I have a scroll bar. I can scroll up and down through the waveforms here. And under the Tools button, there's a Create High Frequency Display. And what that'll do, and I've just got a montage set up for this because it saves it as a montage. It'll launch this uh, display. And by saving it as a montage, it just makes it easy to click in and click out of that and bring up this control panel. So what I can do is I can move the slider and I can bring in 
an overlay of the high frequency. So I'm looking at the high frequency of five microvolts. I'm looking at the burger band EEG at 100 microvolts. So this is being displayed at 100 microvolts, one to 70 hertz. When I move this to the left, when I move it over to the right, it fades in the high frequency and I've selected filters at 50 to 200 hertz, but you can select a range of low cut and high cut filters to modify that. And let's go ahead and change the time scale here. I'm at eight seconds. And we'll move over a little bit. So I can see with each one of these spike discharges, we have a burst of phase lock high gamma. And if I wanted to measure the frequency of these, I can just go to the tools menu, grab quick stats, drag a box around it, and I can see that's 81 Hertz. And you can get some amplitude information as well. So that's the high frequency display and happy to go through that uh, by web conference as well. And with that, we've covered everything we were gonna look at today. Uh, and again, I'm always happy to meet web conference to, uh, uh, to go over anything in detail as well. And we're back to that. All right. And it looks like there may be some questions showing up, uh, but I will defer to our co-host to see uh, what items we might need to address while we're connected. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was a great talk. Um, just real quickly, I wonder if you would mind putting up that last, or maybe it was the first slide that you had of the changes in P14, just so people- Yeah, can absolutely. I'll go ahead and do that. We're discussing. Thank you. We actually had some questions uh, come in during the talk, and at the moment, we don't have any open questions. So. If anyone feels that their answer, their question was not answered or you have a question that you've not yet asked, feel free to type that in now. Otherwise, um, otherwise it looks like we're okay. We had some questions about whether you could export the trend data um, and we are able to export that to CSV uh, format, which is readable by Excel. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a question just now asking if they can obtain the sample data used. So Mike, is this file shareable or not? Oh, absolutely. These are part of our uh, EEG uh, teaching library. And all the examples that we've shown for the, uh, the ambulatory recording, the periodic seizures, the ICD recording, we have that as part of uh, our DVD. And those are also available to look at through the web. So if you email uh, Persist, and we can send, if you'd like to look at the mobile yourself, uh, we can send a username and password and you can connect to Persist Mobile and go through those same examples uh, without installing Persist. You can look at them right through a web browser, look at the trends, game montage and filters for the raw EEG, look at video. And also, uh, of course, we're pretty liberal with trauma modes on software. So if you wanted to uh, get a hands-on on P14, uh, we can look at ways of doing that as well. Great, thank you. There was a, a question about whether or not you can receive um, seizure detection notifications to your email. There is a way to do it through email. It can be, uh, it's one of those things where it relies on the capabilities of the email system and persists access to that email system. So the short answer is yes. Um, and it may be worthwhile to check out the iOS notifications as well, since those are unique to, uh, it puts a badge in there and it'll also send a unique sound notification and so forth. Both are doable. Uh, one of them may be more dependent on the technology of the email server that the hospital uses. Uh, and so that's something that we'll be happy to explore both those options. Okay, great. I was also going to suggest that the uh, push notifications for the mobile iOS device might be the fastest solution for knowing when a seizure was detected and having it go directly to your person. Right, um, so there's a couple of ways to do it, but I, I would agree that the uh, push notifications are uh, pretty modern, pretty fast. Okay, uh, real quickly, we have, uh, there's an easy one here. Will you send us a link to the YouTube recording? Yes, uh, we have part one up already. I, I did put a link to that in one of the other questions in the Q&A. We will send links to both part one and part two to each person who attended um, and also those who registered and did not attend. Um, another question here is how is P14 integrated with different EEG manufacturers? Mike, do you want to describe that? Sure. Um, and with whatever equipment you have, we can uh, answer that individually. 
because each manufacturer's equipment is somewhat different and their software, they may do the implementation of the integration slightly differently. But in the end, uh, you wanna be able to see the trends, have those processed in real time. So you have trending and spike and seizure detection happening in real time. They're visible, uh, it's, if you want at the bedside, they're visible at the monitoring station. Uh, you may want, may not want them visible at the bedside is your choice. You can have them visible at the monitoring station. And for review, when you pull up the uh, EEG and the persist trends, clicking on those trends will move it to the OEM, to the original EEG manufacturer's EEG. And there's integration with comments where uh, detections can be passed uh, to the uh, OEM comment list and so forth. So there's layers of integration that are built in to tie together and make the user persist pretty seamless with the, uh, with the OEM EEG. But all OEMs do their uh, EEG slightly differently and how they uh, do their workflow and whatnot. And so the easiest way to find out how the integration works is we can show it to you because we maintain uh, those uh, capabilities to show the EEG uh, with persist in the OEM environment. And you can try it on your own systems too. Fantastic, thank you. Questions about uh, when will P14 be released? We do expect it very soon. So within the month I would anticipate, but stay tuned as we all know that timelines can change. Okay. Um, one question, how many patients can the trends system support at once? I'm sorry, say again, how many patients can the? Patients can the trends system support at once? So uh, the way that persist is typically deployed is it runs on each machine so that uh, that detection and trending is done in real time. And then on the multi-patient monitor, uh, the limit's really just how many you want to put on a single display. And so uh, if you have a display that has a good size and high resolution, you want to put more windows on there, uh, there's really the, the limit is the number of patients that are being monitored. Practical limitation is just, you know, at what point did they become too small to, uh, to see. So those are configurable. You can have two monitors uh, and have some on one, some on the other. There's different ways to do it. Uh, but the limitation is really more about the display than it is the software. The software can handle uh, as many as you can imagine. Great. Thanks, Mike. Two more questions, I think, uh, for those of you that are able to stay on a few more minutes. There's a question, any chance of extending this to intracranial EEG, particularly the comparison to baseline part? And I'll answer this one quickly. We do have plans uh, in the Persist software to be able to localize and model the three-dimensional positions of intracranial electrodes. And from there, we will link the intracranial EEG data to those 3D positions. And eventually then that would enable the ability to do trending and detection on intracranial EEG data. So um, there are- But I can do trending today with that. Great, thanks Mike. That was one of the examples I first brought up is the, uh, on the HF high frequency display was actually trending of high frequency with that intracranial. So you can do the trending uh, today. Okay. There's the answer to that. And then finally, we have an uh, interesting question. Using the versus baseline trend, one could select a seizure as the baseline and look for Z equals zero. Can the color scheme be inverted so that the extremes, negative six, positive six, are white and the center is maximally colored? Yeah, actually there's a way to have custom palettes. And so if you wanted to uh, reverse that, you could do it. Um, and display it that way as well. So the answer to that is yes, or you could, again, use the, the existing one where you'll see a change from one way or the other, but um, you can uh, have, this, have the color palette pretty much go uh, in any direction using any, uh, any range of colors that you like. Okay, great. And I, I guess there's still a point here that deserves some clarification. Another question came in asking, will the trending available in SEEG my, will the trending be available in SEEG monitoring? I remember the old version cannot do it. So Mike, you had said that the ability to do detection on whatever type of EEG data is available now, it re requires uh, perhaps some customization, but it is possible. There are future plans to turn it into a, a more straightforward clinical product 
um, where uh, we add on the ability to do trending, not only detection, to all types of EEG data. Well, yeah, so the uh, ability to display the uh, data from the trends and you know, frequency of measurements and so forth and integrate that into the displays you described, the, uh, the 3D displays of the uh, array of intracranial electrodes and so forth. Um, but today you could do trending of rhythmicity, frequency versus baseline. Those types of trends you can do on intracranial SEEG data uh, with Persis 14 as it stands. And uh, soon that ability to integrate that in a really uh, pretty compelling visual way uh, is, is the item that Marie has been talking about um, with that 3D rendering of the, uh, of the uh, stereo EEG or grids uh, and being able to uh, see that in a way that lets you know where it's happening in an anatomical way. Okay, thanks Mike. Um, and I think we've covered it. So I think we'll, we'll wrap up here. Thank you again so much for coming. And um, you can contact us with any questions. You can email support at persist.com. Um, and we are happy to answer anything that uh, wasn't addressed or any questions you think of after this webinar is concluded. You will be able to find part one and part two both on YouTube. We will send everyone the links. And I believe that's it. Mike, did I miss anything? I think that's it. And again, any questions, if people want to dig into any particular aspect of the software to see how to do anything, almost anything um, that you'd like, I'm always happy to connect and uh, field questions and, you know, help out with some customizations to look at any particular aspect. Thanks, Mike. Very All much. All right. Thank you. Everyone. All right. Bye-bye. So